So now that we've talked about uh, compensating wage differentials, let's show it in a little bit of an application. And for this case, we're looking at hedonic wage theory. Now, this is a graphical representation of compensating wage differentials, and it looks at um, wage and injury risk. Now, it assumes that all other factors other than wage and injury risk are constant, so as just a basic uh, comparison we can make. Um, so it can, be just, it can be safely assumed that workers who dislike a risk of injury will need a higher pay to compensate for that. Now, keep in mind that um, workers are utility maximizers. Okay, So they want to maximize their utility, not necessarily their income. So let's say that there were two options. At job A, you get $10 an hour, and the risk of you getting hurt while in the job is 5%. Job B, you also get $10 an hour, but your risk of injury is 10%. So assuming that people want to avoid injury risk, which is a rational um, belief, you would think that the, that the worker would take the job that pays $10 per hour, but with only the 5% chance of injury. So the previous indifference curves we looked at were downward sloping, but what's going to happen here is they're actually going to be upward sloping. So let's show that. So here we have, using the hedonic wage theory, um, a graph that plots graphs um, the wage rate and the risk of injury. Now, keep in mind that indifference curves basically are, are saying that at any point along that curve, you are equally as happy. So let's look here at point J. So if you're at point J, you have some wage rate and some risk of injury. Now, at point K, your risk of injury is higher. Now, in order for you to be just as happy as point J, if you have a higher injury risk, you would need to be paid more money just to be equally as happy. So that's why we have the upward sloping. Now, these curves are also convex. And they're convex because when risk is high, um, you're willing to give up more income to lower that risk. But if risk is low, you're not willing to give up as much. The um, Another way to look at this um, is risk averse versus risk less risk averse, basically. So if you remember, the more it kind of pointed towards that axis, the more the person preferred that. So basically, the flatter the curve, the less people are concerned about injury risk and more concerned they are about the income. Whereas the steeper it is, the more concerned they are about um, injury risk and less concerned about the money side. So now let's look on, so that's the employee side. Now let's move to the employer side. Employers are faced with a wage risk trade-off. And the main reason why is that it's costly to reduce the risk of injury. So for example, a uh, construction site. At a construction site, it costs money to give people the proper training to keep them safe. It costs money to give them the proper equipment, hard hat, gloves. It costs more money if, let's say, you have, when you have one person operating a crane, you have another one who has to observe. So these are all things that make, safe, make the job site safer, but it becomes more expensive. And so if it's more expensive, they would have to pay less. Now, one of the things we are assuming, in at least starting out, is that we're assuming perfect competition. And so with perfect competition, we are assuming that all firms are competing against each other, and we're making that assumption of the zero profit, um, or zero economic profits, at least. And the other assumption we make is that all other work conditions are determined externally, um, they're out there, we're just not considering that. So in general, the lower, as you decrease the risk of injury, all right, it's going to lead to increased wages. 
So reducing the risk of injury right, that they need to increase wages. And this becomes important because a firm responds to safety less, they have to be more competitive. And so this is showing this. So here we have zero profit lines. All right, these are known as isoprofit curves. So we have, and this is on the employer side, so we have the wage rate and the risk of injury. And so what you can see is that for some given um, level of or wage, right, zero profit, right, so if the risk of injury goes up, that means that the firm is um, not going is not spending as much to reduce the risk, so the wage rate is going to be higher. But as that weight, as that risk injury goes down, it's more expensive for the firm because they have to pay money to make it safer. And so if that risk injury goes down, they have to pay more. So reducing that risk, they have to pay more, but they have to reduce the wage. Um, if it's costly to reduce risk, there's going to be a larger wage reduction. And so the isoprofics are going to be steeper. So for example, in Y here, Y is going to be um, more costly to reduce the risk than X is. Because if we are at R, for example, and we start to reduce it, you can see that the wage is going to go down faster for X than it is for Y. So we've talked about the employee side, how they want to reduce risk. We talked about the employer side, where um, if they have a higher risk, they can pay a higher wage right, because reducing the risk is costly. So now what happens when we kind of bring this all together, the employers and the employees? So here we're going to bring in and we're going to talk about matching. So competition will lead to a zero profit outcome. Okay, it will lead to a zero profit outcome for the firms. But the firms are going to have different wage risk combinations because they may, um, the firms may have different costs associated with reducing the risk. And so they're going to operate differently. So let's look at an example here where we have two firms and two employees. And so our two, our two firms are going to be firms um, X and Y. Okay. And the employees are going to be employee A and B. So let's first start by looking at the firm. I'm going to try my best to draw this. Pretty well. So if we look at the iso the zero profit isoprofit curves for the firms, we have firm X and firm Y. Now but now however we have the um, the people. Okay, we have the workers. Now, let's first say that um, the firms put out a, um, a, you know, an offer. All right, they come in, they, they make two offers. All right. So firm A puts out an offer of, uh, or sorry, firm Y rather. They put out an offer of W0, or WB, or sorry, WY, so ignore the B part there, and RY. So firm X puts out an offer right here. Firm, oh, sorry, firm Y puts out an offer. Firm X on the other hand puts out an offer here of W, X, and R, X. All right, so these are wage risk combinations. Well, let's see what happens. Let's see which firm or which worker will um, choose which. So let's first say that employee A takes the offer here. And employee B takes the offer here. Right. 
So in this case, employee A is going to be on their difference curve, A1. Employee B is going to be on B1. But what if that were to switch? Okay, what if the, um, instead of employee A taking offer RY, B, uh, WY, this was taken by B, and this one was taken by A. Well, let's see. So now worker B is at B2, and A is at A2. Now, the one thing I didn't know that's worth noting here is that the, fur the higher you get on these indifference curves, the higher the utility level. So, for example, let's just say um, here we have A2 and A1. Let's say we're at this point. Well, here we have W0 and RAX, and here we have WAX and RAX. So in both cases here, the um, worker A is having RAX amount of injury, injury risk, but they're receiving a higher wage along A2. So because of that, they would rather be at A2. So now, in these cases, both workers are better off. Worker B is at a higher indifference curve, and worker A is at a higher indifference curve. And so this is how this basically happens. So the firm, they put out their wages, and then they get um, responses from that, and they get people who want to come out, and um, that the matching happens. So the firm has their zero profits. The workers, they have their preferences. And they want to maximize their preferences. And so the, the choices are made, those combinations of wages and injury risk, that comes from that. Now, these two points here are called offers. So these are offers. WAX, RAX, that's an offer that gets made by firm X. And accepted by person A. Um, WBY, RBY, that's an offer made by firm X, the firm by firm Y, and accepted by person B. So what happens is you have all of these offer curves. And basically, an offer curve, um, in the previous example, we only looked at two workers and employers. But in reality, there's many more. There's a lot of workers and a lot of firms. And so the offer curve ends up being all sets of offers that employers could make zero profit and they could get an employee to still accept it, an offer. And um, for example, in 1970, Congress passed OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Act. And this made stricter safety requirements for all um, private employers. But it didn't necessarily benefit the workers. And so here, pre-OSHA, you had this point here and this point here. These were the two offers. But now because of OSHA, um, there was some maximum level of risk that was allowable. Anywhere over that, it was not. So let's just say that under OSHA, risk had to be less than RAX. Okay. So now the firms had to adjust. Um, they needed to increase, they needed to pay more in order for, to reduce that risk. Now, because of this, person A is going to be wor maybe worse off, but person B could be much worse off because person B may be closer to this WAX, RAX um, offer. And, they, and because person B had a higher preference towards uh, income as opposed to safety, that person is going to see the bigger um, negative effect. So... What's the standard here? Reducing the risks um, increases cost, which reduces the rate, the um, the wage because of that. So a worker accepts a job she thinks has he or she thinks has a low risk, but is actually high. 
So they may receive a high wage rate, say W1. So this is where a worker may think they are, a J. But in reality, they may be at more at point K. So they're receiving W1, so they know that. But they're actually at K. So they think that they're J, but they're actually over here at K. Now, the best the worker could receive um, is W prime, um, but that would be lower level of utility. So the risk is lead to better outcomes. And basically, um, using cost benefit analyses, what tends to happen is you have the offer curve, um, you have utility, and what happens is the, the ways that workers are um, neither better nor worse off in firms for that matter is if they're somewhere in this kind of blue area so that they're both not exactly where they need to be but because of that information asymmetry they're they can get as close with both sides sharing the um, the I guess, I guess sharing the deadweight loss is probably a good way to look at it